All right, Master Chief. Let's see how strong your armor really is. Oh, oh. I'm friggin' believable. internet welcome to game theory where today we're out to answer a question gamers have been asking themselves for 14 years how can master chief have a super suit that costs the same as a small starship one so strong it's able to survive a fall from outer space and yet he's killed with one punch one punch one punch okay so really it takes two or sometimes three the melee, melee! Combat has always been a favorite of mine from the series since I can never quite line up a shot. Stop moving! Please, just, just stop! Stop moving! What I'm trying to say is that I suck at Halo multiplayer, and that without those beautiful insta-kill death strokes, my screen would be filled with more tea bags than a Lipton convention. Pardon the noobness. But despite it being my crutch, it has always confused me how a titanium-plated, physically augmented super soldier like John 117 is so vulnerable to a mere pat on the back. Good job out there, Chief. Great, now I have to wait for respawn. So, with the release of Halo 5, I thought it was high time we put this Mjolnir mystery to bed. What science goes into body armor? How does Chief's suit compare with the technology we have today? And most importantly of all, is there really a reason why melee attacks are so strong against the Spartan super soldier? To help answer this, I partnered with Microsoft to let me borrow a life-sized version of Master Chief's armor, and then speak with a real-life body armor expert to get his take on this iconic armor's design, and what? could be its fatal flaw. But before we talk with an expert, we should first take a quick look at the armor itself. According to the game's lore, the Halo franchise takes place in the fairly distant future, the 25th century and beyond, and the power armor tech has been in development for nearly a hundred years or so, so you can imagine that its design has evolved quite a bit. In fact, Chief's signature armor only came after three other failed attempts. Before his suit came into being, older marks acted more like exoskeletons, with the wearer kind of inside of a robotic cage. Think of it like a Gundam or mech suit, but scaled down quite a bit. These were marks one through three. Bulky, heavy, slow, and powered by an external power source. The armor we're most familiar with in the series operates a little bit differently, more like a second, fortified skin for the wearer. The soldier thinks about what move he wants to make, his muscles begin the motion, and the suit then predicts what the next action will be and responds accordingly. It's an extension of the body, a fusion of man and machine, Protective exoskeleton? Ugh, that is so last mark. This type of functionality, though, comes with a price. You see, canonically, the armor weighs in at a thousand pounds, which, as buff boy as you might be, is gonna be a bit tough to tote around. So, what's an aspiring intergalactic hero to do? Steroids? Well, kinda. As we see in The Fall of Reach, as well as the Halsey Journal, written by Dr. Catherine Halsey, creator of both the Spartan 2 program and the Mjolnir power armor, wearers of the armor need physical augmentation in order to operate the device safely. These include fortifications to the Spartan's bones, growth hormones into the muscles and parts of the brain responsible for growing muscles, and even amping up the wearer's eyesight. And remember how I said the suit's weight doesn't matter since it predicts the wearer's motion? Well, it's able to do this via a neural interface implanted into the wearer's brain. Now, in the Haloverse, everyone in the UNSC, or United Nations Space Command, has one, but the Spartan's is special for use with the Mjolnir armor allowing the suit's AI a direct connection into the brain. So that's what it takes to wear the suit, but what's so special about it? Well, that thousand pounds of weight gets you a lot of protection. The green outer shell, from helmet to legs, is made of thick titanium alloy, bulletproof both in the game and IRL, and is specially treated to disperse the heat from plasma-based weaponry. The black you see underneath, at all the flex points, especially around the waist and neck, is an armored bodysuit made of a titanium-based material. Now, I know what you're thinking. How can you make titanium this flexible? You're gonna be pretty hard-pressed getting that chunk of metal onto your sewing machine's bobbin. Well,
Well, this bodysuit is made of what's known as a nanocomposite material, meaning that the titanium is being woven together with another substance at nearly the atomic level. This is a real-life concept that's really cool, but while it allows for greater flexibility, it also results in a loss of strength. A metal is strong because of the ability of its atoms to link closely together. Think of it like a chain-link fence. All the pieces interlock, and the result is a big, strong, flat sheet. What's weird about this kind of nanocomposite material is that when you start intersplicing it at the nano level with another material, it actually destroys many of the properties that made it strong in the first place. Going back to the fence analogy, imagine if you replaced some chunks of fence with regular fabric, even plastic. Suddenly, there's a whole bunch of weak points. Everything becomes more flexible, but suddenly, the strength is gone. Which is definitely something worth keeping in mind as we assess the strengths and weaknesses of the suit. Below that is a layer of gel which regulates the temperature of the suit and helps lessen damage from falls. And finally, the innermost layer is a sheet of liquid crystal that's knitted together at the molecular level, increasing the wearer's strength, speed, and mobility. How it does this and what exactly it is is a theory for another day, since, let's be honest, it's pretty weird claims for a crystal. But for now, that's all we need to know. In short, on the surface, Chief's Mjolnir is like having a titanium tank strapped to his body. Why then would it have the fatal flaw of melee attacks? Thanks to Microsoft, I had the ability to speak with an armor expert to learn about body armor tech and ask exactly that. Roll that footage! And today we're lucky enough to be joined by Anthony, who's our resident body armor expert. Anthony? Thank you. Thanks for coming in. So tell me a little bit about your experience in the space. I'm with Frontline International and uh, I've been in the business for about 20 years. Okay, so then that must mean that you're really well aware of kind of what new advances are coming down the pipeline. I am, it's a lot to keep up with. What sort of things as as a body armor research and developer are you keeping in mind? Where is technology in this space headed? relation to a Halo, okay. this is probably the only full body suit on the market that actually protects the full body, you know, head to toe. This product right here is only meant to protect you in anti-riot situation. But in Halo, the Mjolnir armor is actually head to toe, from the helmet on top to the giant oversized robotic shoes on the bottom. That doesn't really exist. Are armor developers not worried about kind of what's happening on your legs? We are concerned about that, and of course, yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to get shot anywhere, right? So please cover me up as much as possible, yeah. right? The problem with that is, uh, yeah. you think about how heavy that suit would have to be. Okay. For the most part, we're worried about vital organs and you know body parts that you know you definitely don't want to hurt. Okay. So what are the key areas of the body that we should be worried about protecting? The chest. Okay. And also the head. Obviously, it makes sense. Yep. I'm. I'm I'm noticing that uh, there's a fair amount of protection right in in this region yes. right here. One hit there and you're done. <laughs> so true. Game over. But in Halo, John is actually getting shot with anti-armor artillery, a plasma rifles, regular bullets, and, and his suit has to deflect them all. What sort of weight would that entail? Well, when you think of a ballistic vest, you think of a vest that's going to cover you from neck down to about your hip. Sure. Correct. Yeah. That vest alone can weigh anywhere from 20 pounds all the way up to 50 pounds, depending on what you want to protect against. Let me show you exactly what I mean. Sure, great. This right here is a, called a strike plate. Okay. You can see that's kind of heavy. Oh, jeez. Yeah, it is. Oh my gosh. And this is made out of ceramic? Ceramic, ceramic. okay. But it also has a woven fabric inside the plate itself. How many times can this get shot and still be operable? That one right there is rated to protect against an AK-47 six times. Okay, what happens after six? It's not to say that it will fail, yeah. but there is a higher chance that it can fail. Were these always made of ceramic? That seems very strange to me. No, actually at one time when uh, these were first introduced, they were made of steel. Steel? Which made them probably twice as heavy. So why the jump from steel to ceramic? The heavier something is, the harder it is to move. Sure. As manufacturers, we gotta get lighter and lighter. Okay, so it's bullet resistance balanced against overall weight of the armor. And that was the key word. Yeah. Bullet resistant. Okay. You know, there's a myth saying that, you know, this is bulletproof. A uh, vest or a helmet is not bulletproof, it's bullet resistant. Really? So there's no such thing as a bulletproof vest? There is not. That is a myth. Come on. Really? Yeah. You know, nothing in this industry is bulletproof. So what you're telling me is that there are vests that you then slot this plate into to make it more bullet resistant. Wanna see one? Uh, yeah, that'd be great. Let me go get it. Okay, can basically slip this one on like a t-shirt. So just slot, slot it in like this? Yep. 
There's got to be an easier way to do that, right? Okay. There is. I just wanted to see you do that. Oh, <laughs> thanks, buddy. Here's uh, two plates, one for the front and one for the back. All right. If you can hold that one for me. Wait, this is a lot lighter than the other guy. This is a level three as opposed to that level four. This level three plate will protect you against smaller handguns, uh -huh. and that plate will actually protect you against higher caliber rifles. <laughs> yeah, I see how it is. When it comes time to make me bullet resistant, he cheaps out on me. Thanks. There we go. There you go. So there's the front one. Ooh. Nice and nice and cozy and tight in there. There you go. All right, do I get one in the back yeah, too? One in the back. Here we go. Here, let me turn around. So I gotta ask, I've noticed that thing this whole conversation. What's with the Jason mask back there? Why don't we go check it out? Yes, please. So seriously, this looks like something that like Jason Voorhees would wear for Halloween. What is this? It's actually a ballistic face mask. Ballistic mask. So what you're saying, in all seriousness, because I know that this is serious business, ballistic mask, meaning that this is a bullet resistant face mask. That is correct. And this doesn't feel like it's made out of ceramic. What's this one made out of? That one is actually made out of Kevlar. Wait, Kevlar, okay, so that's a really good question. This whole time we're talking about steel, we're talking about ceramic, where's Kevlar fit into all this? Actually, uh, the majority of the products today are made of Kevlar. How long has Kevlar been in existence? Since the 1970s. Why hasn't there been anything new all that time? They haven't made many advancements since, uh, you know, about 10 years ago with ultra high molecular polyethylene. Wait, so that's the new stuff that's coming down the pipeline? That is correct. This new material is lighter than Kevlar and equally bullet resistant? Actually, slightly higher in uh, ballistic ratings, but really lighter weight. So it sounds to me like all of this technology, be it the steel evolving to the ceramics or Kevlar evolving into this poly ultra stuff, is all about achieving a better balance of bullet resistance to lightweight. Lightweight is the keyword. So, okay, with that being said, let's get your take on the design of Master Chief's armor, shall we? Let's cool. So let's let's bring out John. John. Can I, can I call you Chief? All right, Master Chief. This is Anthony, our body armor expert. Nice to meet you. No offense, sir, but right now, we're just gonna look at the design of your armor and give you a little bit of a critique on what works and what doesn't, all right? So for those of you who might not be aware at home, these top plates are all made of titanium. And underneath, you see these kind of other uh, darker sections. Those are meant to be kind of a Kevlar titanium weave body suit. Uh, there's a lot of other kind of futuristic tech, but we're just looking for some critical design failures or successes that you see here. So in your opinion, as a body armor expert, what works, what doesn't? It's overall a great suit. I mean, of course, being made out of titanium really helps. Titanium is bulletproof, correct? Bulletproof. But it's heavy. Very heavy. Okay. Uh, I estimate this suit to be probably around a thousand pounds, if that, I had to guess. That's actually 100% right. Uh, canonically speaking, the uh, Mjolnir armor, as it's called, is a thousand pounds. Uh, the vulnerabilities I see here, yeah. the joints, you know, you couldn't make a whole suit just without any uh, joints. So mm -hmm. of course you're gonna have some exposure here, here, okay. and here at the legs where you need, uh, of course, you know, to bend here. So is there a way to fix that sort of thing? Uh, it'd be a full body suit, but of course, again, you'll be losing your uh, mobility. If you were to kind of armor coat these parts of his side, now all of a sudden he isn't able to kind of like bend and flex in time. Exactly. So there really is no good way to solve for that problem, or? Well, there is a way you can do it, but that's gonna take away the overall look of the suit. If it's gonna keep me alive in a firefight, why not? So yeah. what, what would that be? Uh, that'd be a ballistic uh, curtain. A like cur a curtain rod around my body, or what do you mean? <laughs> not exactly. What we'd probably do is, uh, you know, have some snap-ons, maybe in two positions here, okay. two here, and then build a ballistic curtain, which would basically hang and cover you. So it's it's literally like like a like a skirt, almost or, like a blanket, and it's bullet resistant. Bullet resistant. What's it made out of? Kevlar or uh, polyethylene. Oh, really? Yeah. So that would still allow you kind of that flexibility of motion, but a greater level of resistance to anything that might be shooting you at either of your sides. That's correct. Th those those nice. Halo love handles, no offense. So outside of that then, I'm seeing that all the other kind of like key places that you outlined are being covered, right? We have the heart and kind of the lungs being protected by the, the titanium plates on the chest. Um, obviously, you know, the central groin region receiving a fair amount of protection with that nice uh, 
armor piece right there. Chief has this leg armor though. Uh, and you mentioned earlier that in real life, people aren't as concerned with protecting the legs. Well, we're concerned about protecting our legs. The problem is we can't sacrifice mobility and speed. Well, fortunately though, for the Halo universe, they've kind of gotten around this weight and mobility problem by including uh, all the Spartans to have these neural adapters to the back of their head, which allows them to kind of link up with a computer system that runs the suit. So, see, Master Chief agrees. <laughs> it's one of those things where now all of a sudden, he's not just wearing a suit like, like a man trapped in a cage. Instead, it's acting like a second skin where because it's hooked into his brain, the suit's able to predict his motion. Okay. Which allows him that ability to be flexible and carry that amount of protection and weight, but do it in a way that's allowing him to maneuver quickly on the battlefield, which is cool. Uh, it makes sense. Okay. Uh, the next concern though, and the, probably the most important concern is gonna be the uh, neck vulnerability here. His neck is exposed. Interesting, so uh, Chief, will you, will you turn around real quick for me? Thank you, sir. You're very accommodating. So one of the things that has always confused Halo fans is Chief is wearing, say, a $3 billion super suit right here. It's the top of line technology for super soldiers in the 25th, 26th century, right? And yet in the games, he basically collapses with one or two basic melee attacks. Which has always struck people as weird that he can have this super armor, but then be so vulnerable to a simple like punch in the back or like an elbow to the head. Remember, we're talking about a thousand pound suit. Yes. So the weight is definitely a factor. Yeah. And once you get the weight of the helmet, which could be anywhere from a hundred pounds, right. I mean, considering the uh, scale, you got a hundred pound helmet moving forward and snapping your neck. Yeah, because it, that's all resting right on his neck. Correct. Correct. That's interesting too, because there's also that neural connection. Maybe even if it's not just the neck breaking, but maybe there's also kind of a loss in that neural connection and how the suit is being operated and kind of being jacked into the brain. Maybe all of a sudden without that neural connection, the whole thing just collapses and, and Master Chief collapses in on himself under that weight. That would be my guess. That's actually really interesting. So, Master Chief, thank you for coming in from the future, letting us critique your armor, dissect it a little bit. And Anthony, thank you so, so much for coming in. It was an honor having you on. My pleasure. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna go wrap up this episode. Maybe, uh, Chief, you should talk to this man about protecting that neck a little bit, huh? Stop getting teabagged up there all the time. Holy cow! Based on the analysis of our body armor expert, in trying to allow Chief's neck to remain flexible, the Mjolnir's design also leaves him vulnerable. But what's the issue here? Neck snapping or neural disconnect? Well, to answer that, we turn to a game that has absolutely nothing to do with Spartans or Mjolnir armor, Halo ODST. You see, in ODST, the power of the melee attacks was drastically reduced, requiring several hits to take down an enemy. The reason that's important is because in this game, you're playing as a regular human not as a Spartan. In fact, the ODST armor may look similar, but is much, much different, acting more like traditional, much lighter body armor. And that gives us our answer. For melee attacks to be so much deadlier in games with Spartans, it has to be something unique to those types of soldiers, their neural link with their armor. An ODST soldier's brain isn't hooked up to a thousand pound suit of armor, meaning melee takes more hits to finish off your opponent because you're actually having to beat them into submission. But in games involving Mjolnir style armor, melee is OP because it's causing the neck to jerk, severing the neural connection between Spartan and suit, headbanging at its finest. As a result, the suit is no longer able to read the mind of its wearer, and without being able to predict that person's moves, it crushes him to death. Don't believe me? We see it in the lore. In chapter 13 of the Halo prequel story, The Fall of Reach, quote, a flat video appeared in the air. It showed a Marine officer, a lieutenant, being fitted with the Mjolnir armor. Power is on, someone said from off screen. Move your right arm, please. The soldier's arm blurred forward with incredible speed. The Marine's stoic expression collapsed into shock, surprise, and pain as his arm shattered. He convulsed, shuddered, and screamed. As he jerked in pain, John could hear the sounds of bones breaking. The man's own agony-induced spasms were killing him. Halsey waved the video away. Normal humans don't have the reaction time or strength required to drive the system. It cannot be powered down, nor can the response be scaled back. 
end quote. And then, once John 117 tries on the suit, quote, the slightest motion translated his thought to motion at lightning speed. It had been so fast. If he hadn't been attached to his arm, he might have missed that it had happened at all, end quote. The key there being translated his thought to motion. Without that connection, John is just as helpless as the spasming marine. The suit's hyper-powerful motion and extreme weight becomes deadly to its wearer. In the end, it's not the melee that kills them. It's the suit itself. Without a neural link intact to keep the suit functioning and under control, it immediately collapses, crushing the wearer inside. It's just a retelling of FNAF 3. John 117 is the purple guy and Mjolnir is Springtrap. Sure, the death animation you see in Halo looks like you've just punched this guy to the ground, but based on the game's own science and real-world body armor technology, that animation is actually showing the suit doing all the killing for you. I guess that back massage chief was promised is off the table. But hey, that's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. Consider subscribing. It does a body good. Like milk. Now, welcome back to the Super Amazing End Card Tournament. For last time, you chose blue as your favorite color. Not all that surprising, really. 23% of you chose blue. Purple made a strong showing with 11%. All of you must be feeling very regal. And rounding up the rear... Poop Brown. Seems fitting. Today, we're picking at your psychology. This one's gonna be fun. Would you rather find $10 million or your one true soulmate? True love for life. So there you go. Love or money. Money or love. Click on one to choose, find out the results next video, and in the meantime, get taken to the channel page where you should subscribe. And then check out some of our other videos. Since you're presumably a fan of Halo, I'd recommend the video revealing the shocking truth behind Destiny's lore or our very first episode on Halo, where we look at exoskeleton science. It is old. So be warned, bad editing and slow VO await you. It's wild to see how far the channel's come. And on that note, thanks again to Microsoft for sponsoring this video. I know that you guys don't like sponsored things, and I turn down a lot of offers to make sure that you guys don't get overwhelmed with that sort of thing. But just so you know, it helps me to expand the team and ensure that you guys get more videos faster. And that's important. YouTube's algorithm feeds off of fast, easy to produce videos. So episodes like this that take hundreds of hours to make and lots of money to find the people, cameras, etc. are honestly fighting a losing battle. There's a reason why we're the only channel in the top 100, 200 gaming channels that isn't a big corporation or isn't producing Let's Play videos. And the occasional sponsorship allows us to fight that battle and show that YouTube video game videos can be more than just a face cam and a green screen. Thank you guys for understanding and for your constant support. Anyway, enough talking. Go click. Love or money. I want to see which one wins. Choose one. Choose it.